Hey guys, uh, this is Seether Court here, and welcome to a uh, new episode of my Seether Talks show here on YouTube. And um, we have ourselves a new guest today um, who has a, a very interesting kind of career pathway kind of choice of what they want to do involving the furry phantom. So they can basically just take the center stage now and introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Severed Sunday. I am a furry trash psychology student from the University of Central Oklahoma. And I make content on YouTube that tries to introduce psychology in a fun and informative light. So that way you guys can maybe join my cause in the attempt of improving everyone's mental health. Or maybe just understand yourself better and the world around you. Good old Oklahoma. <sighs> Tell me about it. <laughs> Amazing. Is my neighbors like are cows. My <laughs> other neighbors are cows. <laughs> Everything is cows. <laughs> oh <my> God. <laughs> it's awful. When I went to Wisconsin, it's nothing but uh, dairy fields and everything. <laughs> I was there for one day, and it was all nothing, just cows and dairy fields and dairy farms. Uh, at least Wisconsin has like a landscape. We have uh, yeah. nothing and miles more of nothing. I hear it's really cold there. Is it really cold in Oklahoma? Uh, okay, so people here like to say it's cold, just like anywhere where people are like, oh, the weather's one way until you wait two seconds, and it's suddenly different. And we all think, oh, that's unique to our area, but it's totally not. Literally every place on the planet's like that. <laughs> so um yeah i guess it gets cold the only thing unique really about our weather though is the fact that you know tornadoes come in just decide to wipe us out every like three or four years so that's cool oh, dang <laughs> tornadoes oh yeah that's great gotta love tornado alley all right so um so yeah basically you're a uh you're a part of a uh, furry youtube channel mm -hmm. and everything and you're implementing the acts and the study of psychology into you know talking about furry related stuff and everything yes. i'm sorry if my uh my vocabulary is dwindling for this episode i'm kind of on a weird mental understand. state don't worry about it. my vernacular really isn't at its peak either <laughs> trust I'm me i'm at a i'm at a very weird mental state right now but <laughs> it's fine That's um fine. so i'll let you uh take over and um basically um give a little story of what got you into the furry fandom and then maybe after that get discuss what got you into you know psychology and then what implemented all of it together into one right. big beautiful pie so yeah absolutely um well where do i start well i guess um like any story i'll start at the beginning <laughs> i whenever i was a young teenager i was not a good person i i was pretty cold-hearted um so i grew up as a gay kid in the south i you know all the trials and tribulations that go along with that uh, not only that, but my family life could have definitely seen some improvement. The location of which I lived was a small Baptist community that was riddled with a lot of drug addiction. Um, oh, and dang. unfortunately, yeah, well, meth specifically. Um, methamphetamines is a really, really bad issue around here. I think we're like number one for opioid abuse under and above 18. And methamphetamine is close behind. <laughs> um but anyway, so that fostered a lot of negative emotions and feelings inside of me uh, to the point where I was dealing with people and the world as if I was seeking revenge uh, in some sick way. <laughs> so I went through the primarily largest portion of my childhood and teenage years doing that. Um, it was very cold, very cynical, cynical and logical uh, until I got to college. And when I got to college, I entered college looking for the resources of power. I was trying to find a way in which I could, you know, gain power over my peers so that one day I could, sh you know, show them supervillain style uh, <laughs> the atrocities of which they forced me to endure. And I, I had heard about something from one of my aunts who is currently a licensed practitioner and she was talking about the Milgram experiment, I believe it was with my grandmother. And for those who don't know, the Milgram experiments on compliance are experiments about how if you use the right social, or social psychology, I believe, tactics, you can pretty much convince 90% of people to kill an innocent person simply by asking. It's a very in-depth look at manipulation. And the goal was to explain Nazi Germany at the time and how where a lot of people just said, I'm just following orders. And people were under the impression of like, oh, it was just Germany, you know, only that was just them. That would never happen here. And so Milgram conducted these experiments to demonstrate it happens everywhere and it happens to everyday normal people. So I went into psychology hoping to learn how to control people because, the, you know, I was a douchebag. <laughs> uh, 
But when I got in there and I sat down and I was ready, the greatest professor probably in the dude who changed my life the most, uh, Dr. Richard Wedemeyer, um, still practices. He's pretty old now, but I think he's planning to go until <laughs> he hits the grave. Uh, amazing guy, though. He comes in and he goes, okay, first things first. Today and through the rest of this class, we're not going to talk about other people. Understanding other people will be something you do later on. First, to understand others, we must first understand ourselves. And when I heard this, I was pretty offended. <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? I'm in my 20s. How can I not understand myself at this point? I'm an adult. Uh, and so that class included a lot of personality inventories. So I would uh, take these personality inventories and slowly but surely, I began to kind of feel uneasy about my responses uh, until one day I went home and I looked in the mirror. And when I looked in it, I saw a monster. <laughs> And that scared the hell out of me. The person I'd become was this wicked, evil thing. And I decided to change. And I put a lot of work into it. I started studying psychology like it was a, you know, a religion. And uh, I went from being a radical anarchist uh, kind of mindset to a more uh, pacifist, humanistic mindset. And... I have it all to thank for him. He mentored me a lot of the way through college. He always believed in me. He met with me after hours. And I went forward. I met some other great professors like Sarah Haas, um, another great doctor, uh, one of the best social psychologists I've ever had the pleasure of interacting with, uh, Elizabeth Boger. Uh, she definitely opened my eyes a lot as well. Um, and my goal is to pay forward the kindness and compassion that was taught to me. They really opened my eyes and opened my heart. And... I taught me that, you know, regardless of the consequences of people hurting me, I should always approach situations with my heart open. Uh, and now I'm reinforced with the fact that a lot of people think that moment I looked in the mirror is the time that haunts me the most, that moment I realized I was a monster. But it's not that. The time that haunts me the most are all the times before that where I was a monster, I looked in the mirror, and all I saw was a person. Um... So psychology is a very important thing to me. A uh, little after that, I fell in love with a beautiful guy. Um, you know, it's my first romantic relationship. Uh, it was great. Uh, <laughs> everything was swimming. We lived together. We had plans on getting married. And then one Thursday afternoon, I believe, uh, he just woke up and he realized he didn't love me anymore. No rhyme or reason, really. We were both young. There could be a myriad of, myriad of issues. Um, I don't really blame him either. So right after that, I was distraught. I almost fell back in my old ways of thinking, this whole idea of closing off my heart and being this cynical bastard <laughs> uh, to everyone. And I went and I contacted my professors and they gave me hopeful messages and all that. And they gave me advice. I followed my science to the T on what I should do. And then I was just kind of left alone. Uh, so I decided that I was going to dive into a community of which that... I had an interest in for a long time, but never really had the want or need, I guess, to interact. Uh, and I guess you can tell what fandom that was. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I joined that. I find a Discord server, and I go into that, and I met an amazing community, a community I totally had <laughs> underestimated, something I wish I'd become a part of a long time ago, uh, beautiful people with great creative works, um, but unfortunately, I also saw that behind a lot of these screens and message boards, there are a lot of people who were just like me. They're slowly turning into this horrible monster because of the situations they're in and their lack of knowledge or inability to handle it, which I completely understand. Um, and that really troubled me. It wasn't a while later that another new person joined the server who I became friends with. Uh, this person is Neocryptic. They are a beautiful artist. Um, and at the time, they were you know, suffering just as greatly as everyone else, but they expressed it so majestically through their drawings that I really, you couldn't help but look at it and not feel something. And so I decided that in order to help myself and help me overcome my issues, I was going to help them. And so we worked a lot together. We got them to the right resources, the right people, and slowly their life began to change. And they joined me in my cause and of, you know, just trying to make the fandom a better place. And I took that as a, you know, scenario. I was like, what if I could do that for everyone? 
uh, and they agreed. So we sat down and we brainstormed about a way, because I'm not at the point where I can be a licensed practitioner. I would love to do volunteer work for the fandom someday, but unfortunately I'm just not at that level yet. So we brainstormed, brainstormed, brainstormed about our strengths and what we could do. And eventually we came around to the idea of like, what if we created this YouTube channel in which we can talk about psychology and you know educate people and hopefully get them a better understanding of themselves and maybe then they can join our cause as well just like she joined mine um so we were on the fence about that and we were just scrolling through youtube trying to figure out how everything works uh and i actually encountered seether and he was a big inspiration of mine uh part of the reason being that i saw these big youtubers like uh beta and majira and odin and they were really great people and really interesting to watch but the issue is it was hard to relate to them and mostly it's a social context they live in a drastically different environment of which i grew up in growing up in the south um but when i encountered seether that wasn't the case seether grew up in a very similar environment and i felt a lot of relation there you know i felt like okay well you know, I'm not the only one out here <laughs> in the South <laughs> right now. So uh, that definitely helped push me forward. And we finally went forward with the project and we've been working on it ever since. Well, that's great. And I appreciate the uh, compliment there. <laughs> no problem. All right. So that's kind of like how you wanted to really uh, wrap in like psychology mm -hmm. with uh, the furry fandom. If mm -hmm. I could ask really, um, what really made you feel kind of like, the need to really want to push that kind of like help with like mental health and like understanding like the brain a lot for many people within the furry fandom like is there a reason behind that do you see any like signs of the people within the fandom needing that help right now uh yeah there's there's quite a bit um and a lot of it is self-report data um a lot of them will openly tell you that things are not great mentally for them uh i believe um I believe Odin just released a video talking about his depression. It's and it's that's what I'm saying. It's like it's not just, you know, the random people on the internet. It's literally this community has a lot a lot a lot of mental issues that are not getting resolved. And unlike uh, let's take the LGBT community, which is also a minority that undercomes a lot of, you know, uh, stereotypes and prejudice and discrimination, um they are catered to. They have psychological teams and hotlines and websites and a whole myriad of resources of which are available to them. The difference between them and us is that we don't. There really hasn't been anyone who's decided to apply psychological science and, you know, help to this community. And so I'm hoping to, you know, start that. I'm hoping to inspire, you know, other psychologists and, uh, you know, people to really you know, take a look at a fandom of which we've taken a blind eye to for a long time. <laughs> did I answer that makes question? sense. Yeah, it really yeah. did. Um, if I could, I really ask, um, really with, uh, when it comes to like the furry fandom and everything mm -hmm. and kind of, uh, applying like psychology to it, like what really like further methods do you plan to do? Like once you use this, you know, because for starters, you're using the YouTube channel and everything mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. you're implementing you and your uh, two other uh, coworkers and everything yes, involved yes. with the channel uh, to um, get the word out. Mm -hmm. What's like the, do you guys have like a future plan in mind or is that still like kind of a work in progress of what you got planned to really like make the impact to help us out oh, in yeah. this community? Well, we do have some ideas. Unfortunately, the future is never as concrete as we seem. Uh, in fact, one of my uh, channel cohorts, Neo, uh, always likes to say, the future will change, but never in the ways we expect. Mm -hmm. So, but the idea is eventually once I get my practitioner's license and get a little more involved with the, you know, professional psychological community, uh, especially because I happen to have family in it and stuff like that, I'm hoping I can recruit them and possibly start like a hotline. For example, here in Tulsa, <laughs> we have a system called COPES which is a hotline that caters to specifically people in that community uh, that helps with, you know, just generalized depression, uh, thoughts of suicide, um, struggling with trauma, going through the stages of grief. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing, and it's helped so many people, and I've witnessed it firsthand. I also want to try to do some more research within the fandom, because if you haven't noticed, since we're kind of new to the stage, there isn't a whole lot of social research specifically catered to this group. Um, and I'm hoping that if we can do that research, we'll get a better understanding of what exactly makes the group tick on a psychological scientific level 
and apply that as a way to improve upon it and improve upon its influence on its members. Okay. If I could really backtrack for a second, because Absolutely. we've gone a lot into psychology, but I also really want to go into furries, and we've talked about it a little mm-hmm. bit, not too much. So I wanted to ask, like, what really got you into the furry fandom specifically without Specific- having to put the psychology <laughs> yeah, aspect absolutely. to it? Um, what is attractive about the furry fandom? Um, like not as what's attractive, like what really inspired you? What right. really got you aware of it also? Right. Okay. Mm. So my first experience with the furry fandom was uh, interesting. It was back when I was in high school and when there was a kid, you know, I think we all knew this kid, the kid who runs around with ears and a tail. I had no idea what the furry fandom was. Uh, and then all my friends, because I was a jerk, so I hung out with jerks, uh, were like, look at that dumb kid. And, you know, obviously much harsher words. And I was like, yeah. But on the inside, I was like, I kind of want to do that. <laughs> and so um, I, uh, I started doing research on the internet. I came across... Uh, a bunch of things <laughs> uh some of them amazing some of them interesting uh some of them downright odd but overall i found a lot of really beautiful ways of projecting yourself because something the fandom i think does more than any other fandom this one specifically uh we're really really good at expression in the sense of our art and our creations and our representation like take like the anime fandom for exemption or not exemption example jesus uh there's it's a very similar fandom right but the difference is is while they take characters that already exist and you know in adopt them as their online persona uh we instead create characters uh from our own you know feelings of ourself and our self perceptions and then use them as a way to slowly become the person we want to be. It's a really great way of turning your actual self into your ideal self, which by the way, is something I discussed on my channel. These, uh, was it self discrepancy theories? (laughs) Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, that's why I actually was thinking with, um, the furry fandom and everything. And now that you actually relate it to the anime fandom and all, Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes, I feel like one kind of problem that I see, not just for myself, but a lot of people within this fandom is, uh, is uh, when it comes to uh, a fandom dying out and everything. Because, like, when it comes to, like... And I feel like that might be a big issue for me because mm-hmm. this fandom pretty much fuels my entire channel. So, yeah, fandom absolutely. dies out. I don't know what to do. But the thing is... Uh, the thing is, I always felt that, like, um, when it comes to, like, the anime fandom or maybe, like, the gaming community in the world or on YouTube, mm-hmm. there's all... It's always going to be, like... Those are an industry within themselves. There's always... Yes, absolutely. going to There's always going to be, like continuous like content and there's not really any real sign of them slowing down or stopping mm-hmm. like the brony community mm-hmm. like i don't like the, the my little pony show yeah. like, that just ended like this past week mm-hmm. and that show I, I wouldn't say it's necessarily like not gonna have supporters but that fandom has pretty much died out as it is and every person who is making bro- brony related content on youtube is pretty much you know their channels died off and everything mm-hmm. but um the furry fandom i wouldn't say has reached uh, its end point. I will say, I do think that the furry fandom has reached its peak. And I think that the level of popularity or like relevancy it had in like 2017 and 2018 will probably never be reached at that level again, unless maybe something happens like, like Minecraft getting popular again. But, um, I, I don't know. I don't know if, uh, I feel like the furry fandom is something that has, it's a, uh, it has, it's a resource that's uh, deplenishing over time and that uh, I don't know if the furry mm-hmm. fandom really will have. We got to like kind of maybe do something different or got to find a way to make the it's still interest and make sure mm-hmm. it doesn't like die out mm-hmm. and become like the brony fandom. Right. Well, I would like to say that I do believe that the fandom isn't going to die. Uh, luckily, we see a lot in societies and in cultures. Whenever something you think is died out, it immediately comes back as like retro or you brought up Minecraft, for instance. And a large difference between the brony fandom and the furry fandom is while the brony fandom is specifically rooted in a show, a, you know, a single thing, the furry fandom is not. The furry fandom comes from a myriad of creation expression, not just, it's a more of a archetype rather than, you know, a singular source. So if any one singular source falls off, the fandom will be fine. Um, oh. oh, sorry, go ahead. No, you can keep going. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Uh, so I don't believe the fandom is going to die out. We may see dips and, you know, peaks. It happens with literally any cultural group. That's absolutely fine. But the nature of the fandom is very malleable. It can really be applied to anything. You can do be a furry anything. 
you know, there's no limitations. And that's something that fandoms that are centered around a specific anime or a specific TV show do not have. To compare, like, the difference would be, like, okay, um, let's say it was a whole community built around you, Seether, right? Oh my God! <laughs> right, I know. It's, tell me about it. A great example. I've already, <laughs> I've already ruined let's, everything. Just let's talk about how great I am. You know, no. I'm just so great. <laughs> but let, yeah, absolutely. Um, but let's say that your content came to an end. Uh, let's say it's like 150 years from now, right? You've stopped. I'll posting. be dead. Uh, I'll be dead. <laughs> we're all cyborgs, and we live in space. Um, <laughs> you know, like but, be like Walt Disney and like you know freeze my head to make videos. There, so. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh. Your community, yeah, it would probably go somewhere else. Um, but the fandom as a whole would be around. And I compare that to, say, cartoons and the Brony fandom. The Brony fandom is centered around one specific content creation, one specific creator or team or whatever. Uh, but if you were a fan of cartoons overall, then you'd have nothing to worry about. Make sense? It's the it broadness sense. of the category that gives it safety. That makes sense, and you kind of make sense with that, and it kind of helps change my opinion a little bit. I just would, I was kind of, in my opinion, I would still say that I do think that there is a chance that the furry fandom can still survive for many years to come. It's just that I think that compared to, like, other communities like the anime fandom or, like, the gaming fandom or, like, heck, people that are into politics or stuff, those have way more power and have a lot more strength and lasting way longer than the furry fandom has, and the furry fandom kind of has some catching up that's, to do yeah that's opinion. absolutely it definitely has catching up to do a lot of those things have existed for a very long time but we have to remember that all those things started somewhere i mean people used to literally bring dvds or vhs tapes or whatever of anime across the ocean and it was a very small thing and not only that it was incredibly niche uh it was kind of looked down upon socially <laughs> that was a thing uh and then it still kind of is it's still well, yeah definitely first off being in anything is looked down upon if you have an interest in anything someone out there doesn't like you for it sorry but that's just how it works <laughs> mm. but um but it exploded and then for a while it started to die out we know this uh you had like the what 80s 90s anime thing and it re-exploded again and it, it's all when about, tsunami became a thing exactly it's all about peaks and downsides there's never this one constant you know scale upwards it's always going to be up and down the whole way i don't see the furry fandom as being any different than that you know we've seen it repeated through many different groups fandoms and cultures so i don't see why we specifically would be exempt mm -hmm. i remember i saw like i think it was from like a year or two ago i talked to someone i think back in my days when i was on skype before mm -hmm. microsoft pretty much plunged oh, it down God. the toilet <laughs> Or, yeah, for once Microsoft bought out Skype, then bye bye. Go to everyone went to Discord. But mm -hmm. um, when when I was still on the Skype days, when I was first getting involved with furries, I remember I talked to this one person that had a very out there opinion. And I'm not saying it's either correct or incorrect, but they said that one way to keep the fandom like lasting forever is like once furries try to get into like transhumanist and everything, and like getting into like surgical procedures to become an anthro. And that is a genuine Bro, opinion I, I heard from there. I want superpowers. Come on, science. What are you doing? Give me laser vision. <laughs> hey, if we have people that are literally are getting like robotic arms and heart, exactly. hearts and everything, we are. It's scary to think that it, like we literally are getting to the point where, yeah, like some people are becoming part robot. Mm -hmm. And maybe a part furry. Who knows? I think That's it's we're all. I, it's we're all gonna. I think. Yeah, I think <laughs> we're all gonna be pretty much dead before everyone watches this video. Will be dead before we get to that point. But who knows? <laughs> Not you guys. Well, the, Look, I'm immortal. I don't know what you guys are talking about. <laughs> I don't know if uh if if the global warming doesn't get to us first though. But listen, listen. Sunday's a zombie. He'll live forever. It's fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> oh, uh, man. But yes, no. Um. Though I guess that's interesting. I, but. I don't think that's what's going to make the fandom last. I think what's going to make the fandom last is, honestly, the fans. And that's what makes mm -hmm. any fandom last, is the fact that our passion just isn't going to die out. I know when I'm 40, I'm not just going to suddenly not think, like, furry stuff's cool. You know, it's been a long time now, and now it's just going to, like, jump off a cliff and be like, oh, I'm just not interested anymore. <laughs> uh, so I think that we'll slowly go up and down the whole way, and while that would be that's definitely an interesting hypothetical i can't realistically see that being the determining factor in the fans existence in the future it would be pretty pretty crazy if it was the case though oh, yeah. getting to the point where we're transcending human well, I mean, humanity uh not really a psychology topic but you got you know about the CRISPR method right i believe you didn't you mention that before we started recording no 
Okay, you can explain it for the audience and myself. <laughs> yeah, okay, absolutely. The CRISPR method is probably the best genetic alteration method we currently have available. It's shown increased success amongst like small insect life and plant life. Um, cause we had this issue when we were altering genetics before they, you know, things kind of died. <laughs> they didn't live very long, but we've shown that we can edit like mosquitoes to be immune to malaria and stuff like that, which, um, the implications are up in the air still uh, of how we're going to use it. Because obviously at first, the first people are going to have access to it are the incredibly wealthy and it's already hard enough to compete pete with uh trump jr uh but wait till he's like a nine foot tall superhuman <laughs> then it's gonna be much more difficult um but i would say that with that method it's a possibility to make some type of limb that would not be instantly rejected by the body um the issue would be how to make that limb operable and not just like a lump of flesh that's been sewn to your arm <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> so it's a possibility. It's a possibility. A very interesting technique. I highly suggest you guys do research into it because it's going to be a big issue coming up in the next 20 years. I'm 100% sure of that. Hmm. Um, second to last thing I really wanted to cover is um, when it comes to like YouTube, because you said you have brought up about how, you know, you wanted to do the YouTube channel as like kind of the starting goal to really help with your main objective for, mm-hmm. you know, helping mm-hmm. psychologically with mental health with furries and all. Yeah. But, um, and you, you said that you were in charge of, the uh, editing and the script writing? Oh, yes. Yeah. So the information, uh, the edits, all that is me. Um, our music, we got a new music person. That would be Dead Sock. Uh, you know, really happy to have him aboard. He's exceptionally good with audio. Up until that point, audio was handled by Neo Cryptic, the artist of the channel who not only uh, helps manage our social medias, but also all the Sunday art, all that, all the entire aesthetic of the channel, all that gets thanks to Neo, you know, so round of applause to her. Uh, and I'm really fortunate to have them helping me out and, you know, that I'm not alone in this. I'm so grateful. They're amazing people, and I hope you guys can go support them as well. Yeah, great. Mm -hmm. Um, I wanted to bring that up because uh, I would say, like, uh, I wanted to bring up a little bit of a discussion about YouTube also because I usually want to, like, throw in YouTube with this very related podcast sometimes. Um, I, I'm not saying, I'm not trying to assume, but, uh, do, would you say whether or not you have had a passion for YouTube in the past before that made you want to start, make YouTube be the first step for this? Well, would you I, say you ever had a passion actually, for it? <laughs> um, lesser known, I actually did have a channel before this one a long time ago. I hope no one finds it. I really should find it myself and get rid of it <laughs> because it's, it's not great. Um, but I don't know. I've always been interested in the idea of using YouTube as an inner informational uh, platform uh though at the time i really wasn't specialized in anything i don't i barely call myself somewhat specialized now but i uh, it was just a gaming channel like you see everywhere uh, except for it was in vr because i was a big vr gamer for a while i was part of the vr master league and uh so that was a big reason i chose youtube specifically over other platforms because i already had experience in it and i personally find the format a little better geared towards education than say, I don't know, Instagram or Twitch. (laughs) Oh yeah. Like I can see that. I think when I look at a lot of like, you know, statistics or graphs, cause I like looking at that stuff when it comes to technology and everything, they never Mm -hmm. list YouTube as like a social media platform. It's really more of a, uh, video database. It's kind of like video database, you know, content creation, kind of like that. It really, I know that YouTube originally was built as a dating platform website, but Wait, what? YouTube I had no would, idea, actually. Oh, yeah. It used, it used originally back when it, it was only really for like the first maybe like month or so, but it was a dating platform and the main color was purple. Huh. So, but uh, yeah, I just think that, um, yeah, YouTube to me really, it doesn't really fit as a social media platform. It's going to definitely outlast most of these uh, oh. social media platforms, oh, though, like yeah. Twitter. Twitter's already pretty much on its last leg, pretty much. Didn't they and, kill uh, Vine though? So like you know, what goes around comes around. Twitter. <laughs> I, think, I think they re. I think they just uh, rebirthed it as a uh, TikTok. That sounds weird. Is re-birthed. it? I thought TikTok was just Musically. Yeah, and then Musically became TikTok. Is I that believe. owned by Twitter? I, I don't know. Can we get confirmation? <laughs> uh, okay, maybe I'll someone in the comments own. will know. <laughs> Comment down below. You'll get a favorite. Exactly. But, there we go. Or pin pin comment. Yes. Do but, our Google um, search for us. Go ahead though. 
Um, I wanted to ask, like, uh, you said you made your gaming channel video and everything like that, mm-hmm. gaming channel uh, content and everything. Was there any, like, YouTubers that have inspired you within the past, like, not even just with furries, like, any, like, just... before, like, how long have you been watching YouTube or been on the platform, oh. like, just experiencing videos? Wow. Uh, so, um, a long time, back when YouTube had a layout that looked a lot less like Facebook and a lot more like MySpace, where things were just kind of random. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. very long time. Um I would say, though, the biggest inspiration as far as YouTubers go would be Salmonella Academy, Vsauce, and ASAP Science. Oh, great. Yeah, all three uh, of those were really cool. I love the idea of using the platform as, you know, informational thing, and uh, I think all three of them did it very well. Oh, yeah, and um, it's pretty much gotten to a point where... Um, I, I used to be kind of way more critical about YouTube, and YouTube definitely still has its problems, oh, but yeah. even with YouTube's, like major mess ups they've had these past couple years youtube has gotten and accomplished so much to where even with the continuous uh mess ups they still got definitely still have a couple more years left on them under their belt to mess i'm not saying it's a good thing but they they're still it's still going to be around for quite a while because i'm not saying Mm. everyone's applied to this but even when it comes to like entertainment people Mm. these days are preferring just watching YouTubers make these YouTube videos for their entertainment rather than like movies or TV. Not fully, but a decent portion of people are like, even for myself, like mm-hmm. when it comes to my entertainment, mm-hmm. instead of watching a movie or a TV show, I want to watch a YouTuber. Yeah, ab- completely. Absolutely the same way. Um, no, and YouTube kind of has a monopoly on as far as like online social media videos, period. Uh, Twitch is really coming up strong, but it's not really YouTube. Uh, so when you have a platform that's that concreted, like whenever someone says, look up a video, they almost always mean go to YouTube. So oh, yeah. it, when it's that concreted into just like the basic thinking, it's going to be hard to overthrow it. Uh, take Coca-Cola, for instance, people in the South here, um, you may have noticed either we call everything Coke. <laughs> Pepsi is Coke. Um, seven up is Coke. Uh, you go get mellow yellow, mellow yellow is Coke. You know, we go to a restaurant, they say, what kind of Coke would you like? It's just that basic heuristic of thinking that, in my opinion, is just going to keep it a very relevant thing for a very long time. I always wanted to have a Mexican Coke. I hear they're way better tasting than regular sweeter. Coke. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. I, man, I went to Mexico when I was younger, and I never got one. That's a big disappointment. <laughs> oh, yeah, but that's because Mexico has a very uh, different, or they have a very strong sugar base with their food. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So surprisingly, um, we when we think of Mexican food, we think of a lot of spicy stuff, but that's not the case. <laughs> it's oh, not really. Re- there, a lot of Tex-Mex is a lot spicier than traditional Mexican food, I found. Uh, now, granted, you go to the border towns, and they're definitely going to have spicier foods because they're kind of catering to the American concept of what Mexican food should be. But if you go like farther, like Mexico City, um, it's going to be a lot less crazy. Like, you're not going to bite into something and wish you were dead. <laughs> I, can, I can understand that yeah mm-hmm. um what but anyway to get off the topic of like mexico if yeah, that's absolutely, all right, yeah absolutely um, the last thing i wanted to really discuss before we wrap it up for today mm-hmm. um i usually i always tend to ask people like when i bring up youtube in these podcasts like what is the state of youtube i felt like i've already repeated that question too much with my past guests and mm-hmm. now i kind of want to ask like we all know that youtube has its problems and i do feel like youtube will eventually like fizzle out and not be relevant Mm -hmm. anymore if they continue with the bad choices they're making Mm -hmm. and it makes some good choices but for the most part it's bad but if they um the question i want to ask like when it comes to the content creators which is the only really like which is the thing that drives the platform absolutely the platform being nothing um, without the content creators yeah where like where do you think the state of actual content is going would you say that content's getting better overall on youtube from the youtubers themselves would you say it's staying average or do you feel like when it comes to the actual substance of what they're making do you feel like there's like a bad trend with it i worry at the fear of being original you know i'm i worry we a lot of people see like take pewdiepie for instance you know the god of youtube uh how many copycat channels exist thousands upon thousands upon thousands even some of the more popular channels clearly were heavily 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 inspired by pewdiepie and what i worry about there is the fact that instead of exploring their own way to present themselves they're just trying to be pewdiepie number two (laughs) uh they're trying to you know be the next whatever but instead of being the next pewdiepie they should be the first whoever they are 
Make sense? Yeah. Uh, they're yeah, they're even- afraid they're going to fail if they're not fitting into this popular YouTuber's style or idea of what a popular YouTuber is. But if we throw away that concept, they'll find that people are a lot more interested in you. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, and that's just the thing. Also, with come with being original and everything like that, mm-hmm. With I can understand maybe like being original would be important back maybe in the first two or three years of YouTube. But because there's so many YouTubers out there, like YouTuber, being a YouTuber used to be like kind of a niche thing. But now everyone's a YouTuber. Yeah. It's virtually impossible to not be copying something or doing something someone already did yes, it's just don't get it, me wrong the game yeah, yeah the youtube game now in mm-hmm. my opinion mm-hmm. is it used to be making original content and now it's basically just try to make the best content of what's already being made and there's nothing wrong with that mm-hmm. you know my content there are like five other furry youtubers on this platform that are making the same kind of content as i am mm-hmm. and there's mm-hmm. nothing wrong with that i just try to make I just try to be the best at this, and that's yeah. it. I completely understand, and yes, that's definitely another way to go about it. You know, if you can be the best at whatever niche or category you're in, uh, go all for it, as long as that's what you want, as long as that's you, you know? Be yourself. Mm-hmm. That's the thing. If you is like this other person, then that's absolutely fine. But don't be like this other person because you feel obligated to. Does that make sense? Oh, Oh, yeah. And then Mm -hmm. there was like, I think I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I've heard of like really bad cases of where people are just, you know, flat out copying our YouTubers like page by page where I think there was like one case where there was this one female YouTuber that was uh, copying this other guy's videos. But um, they were there was like a language barrier. There were like two different languages and they, they basically just copied like word for word of each of their videos but the only difference was the language change so and they got caught eventually love plagiarism yeah (laughs) and yeah and we live in a you know a very large society i mean how many people are on earth now like nine million some or not nine million (laughs) jesus that's not very much like nine billion somewhere around there yeah uh Uh, i I, I can actually check that right now i think we're at about 8.8 billion yeah somewhere around there um so that's it's going to be hard to have an absolutely pure original idea. Uh, but what's great is that you can take aspects of a whole bunch of other people and that you enjoy and that fit your personality and who you are and combine them. Uh, take my channel, for instance. I'm taking psychology lessons, uh, and I'm also taking you know notes from Seether Cord and Beta and a whole bunch of other people uh, and kind of combining them into a more me thing. Does that make sense? It's like a remix of everything. Oh, yeah, it makes total sense. Exactly. And then, I, like, and then <laughs> I don't want to like, I'm not saying you would do this, but I was just thinking like of that meme or something where it's like, hey, can I copy your homework? And, like, yeah, just change like a few of the answers. <laughs> kind of that, that meme. It's all right. I'm just going to download see record videos from now on. Just copy paste my, uh, my persona on top of it. How about that? <laughs> that, will get you sus- that will get your channel suspended. <laughs> oh, man. Are you telling me that people actually, you know, want to keep their content, their content? Ah, oh, yeah. shameful. <laughs> anyway um i think that's pretty much everything i wanted to cover this is a really uh I-, I like doing this episode a lot thank you oh, thank you thank you for having me on i appreciate the opportunity no problem uh any uh i'm gonna give this last minute or two for you basically just shout out every way to uh find your content online every way you can find whatever business yeah absolutely basically go for um it. so i have an instagram i uh, which i need to post more on to be honest so not the preferred method but uh it's severed sunday i also have severed sunday twitter uh, on Discord, there's if you look up Sever Sunday, I think my number is 0001. Uh, you can find me there. Um, I love talking to new people. I'm totally fine with that. Uh, you know, you can find my YouTube channel. It's Severed Sunday as well. I know I'm super original with these names. Can I establish that? <laughs> uh, uh, you can find me pretty much anywhere. Um, yeah, if there's a social media platform, just type in that name and I'll pop up. I, yeah. You know, and... Shout out to, uh, also, I'd like to just shout out again to Lolly and Neo. You guys have supported me a lot in this process, and I couldn't be here without them. Um, and if I could leave one final tip for, you know, everyone listening, is that mm-hmm. I have a saying, and it's accept nothing less than happiness. But I'm not talking about happiness for yourself. Accept nothing less than happiness for those around you, your social groups, and your community. You'll always have sadness but never accept that sadness. Always feel like there's happiness to be found and you just got to look for it.
I don't know if I should do like the clap or do like the snap. Yeah, thing it, do it's and, like, fine. You could have given me dead silence, and I would have just been like, "Oh." <laughs> I appreciate. No, but it. it's no, it's it's a nice thing you're saying. You know, I teared up a little bit. <laughs> <I'm kidding. laughs> right. But no, it's a nice thing. Um, so yeah, everything again. You have your Instagram. Mm-hmm. You have your uh, Discord. You have your YouTube, mm-hmm. and uh, you have a uh, Twitter. No, Twitter and also oh, an yeah, yeah, Twitter. Oh yeah, everything will be linked down in the description and also be featured in one of the uh, end cards of this video. So, any last words before we head out for today? Uh, oh god, how do I one up that thing I just said? <laughs> um, well, I hope that you all have a wonderful day and I appreciate you listening to us, and especially me ramble on with verbal crutches and a lack of knowledge of what I'm doing. <laughs> well, you're very knowledgeable, don't say that. Oh, anyway, uh, we'll see you guys in the next video. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs> bye bye. Come on, come on. Who spun me out? <laughs> I'm sorry. Was that you? Yeah. You're gonna make Mario win. I was I was not aiming, I just shot it. No sex. No, I'm kidding. No. I'm just kidding.